Well, thank you very much. Um, what I'd like to do for my 25 minutes is share with you my story and how I really approach design projects and a little bit about some of the projects that I've actually been working on. So my story started when I was four and I used to spend hours with my granddad in his shed at the bottom of the garden. And I used to watch as he would take scraps of materials and turn them into toys for me and my cousins. And I was absolutely fascinated by experimenting and exploring. I wanted to understand how we could take things apart and put things back together and how things would work. And my granddad shared his experiences with me. And looking at my granddad's shed, you can see some of the tools and the machinery that he had. And before starting secondary school, I was able to use a lathe, I was able to use a pillar drill. I knew how to use the different tools. I could understand the different properties of materials. My granddad really ignited a creative spark for me, um, which is something that I would never lose. Upon starting secondary school, though, I became quite frustrated and bored by the projects we were given in class. So they'd ask us to create a clock, but the clock we were asked to produce would only differ by the shape and the colour of the plastic. So all my friends, when we sat there in a classroom, all you know, bored by this idea that we had to design the same product, pretty much. That wasn't being creative, that wasn't exploring, and that wasn't experimenting. That was boring. Um, and so a lot of young people lost interest. Fortunately for me, my granddad had already ignited that creative spark, um, and it, I knew that there was more to this technology, more to design, and more that can be achieved in a classroom. Um, so when I was 15, I decided that I wanted to solve a, a real problem. I didn't want to start creating these clocks, these pencil holders, um, you know, these solitaire games. I wanted to create something that actually solved a real problem that I could identify. Now, my other granddad, not the granddad with the shed, he suffered from arthritis, and he couldn't squeeze a toothpaste tube. Um, for me to identify this problem, I simply just spent a day with him, watching what he could and couldn't do. To me, that was a really logical way to identify a need, to identify this problem that I was going to, going to solve. So watching him squeeze this tube, um, I realized that if I could actually change that squeezing action into a pushing action, I could allow my granddad to get toothpaste out of his tube. So I came up with the really simple uh, toothpaste dispenser with the lever. Um, you could change the tube really easily. And my granddad was able to get toothpaste out of the tube. Um, I installed it into his bathroom, um, and I could see him using my product, which was a real, I guess, an ultimate reward for any, any designer, really. The toothpaste dispenser didn't just dispense toothpaste. There's lots of different things that come in a tube. Um, and there's lots of people who suffer from arthritis, not just my granddad, um, but there's also people who maybe can't use just one, they can only use just one hand, or it could be used to dispense, um, be used in hospitals when people don't want to consider using uh, both hands when dis dispensing soap or whatever they needed to use. So there's lots of uses for this toothpaste dispenser. Um, unfortunately, at the time, I didn't know anything about patenting. Uh, my teachers put me forward for a technology competition at school, and I lost all rights to my product. Um, but it was a lesson that oh, well, I learned and I never make the same mistake again. <laughs> so then moving forward, I got, well, I was 16 and I um, took product design for my uh, A-levels, which is the exams in when I was 16. And I wanted to design another real problem. I wanted to solve another real problem. But I wanted to think bigger than just solving a problem for my granddad who suffered from arthritis. Although it was important to me and obviously my granddad, I thought, you know, what else can I do? Um, so I was interested in um, a competition that we were offered at school called the Sustainable Design Award. And what they wanted young people to do was to think about issues that were affecting the world and thinking about how you can use design and the sustainability in order to solve that problem. Now, I chose a brief on transporting water. And that made me think about people in Africa who would transport water daily, whether it was collecting one bucket of water on their heads or two buckets on their shoulders. And I thought, how can I make this journey more efficient for these people? Um, how can I create a product that would allow people to transport maybe up to five buckets of water? I created um, a water carrier, and this is the children's version. I know it sounds awful that I've created a water carrier for children, but actually they spend um, a lot of their time collecting water with their, with their um, mums. So depending on how tall you are, you can actually carry five buckets of water. But the idea behind this product is that it was actually to be produced locally, using locally sourced materials in Africa. So instead of me producing a water carrier and getting it mass produced, I really considered how this product would be produced and who would produce it. So looking at the kind of sustainability and the inspiration from my water carrier, 
I looked at how the product could be pegged together using real, really simple wooden dowels or tree, parts of trees, tree branches, that would mean that if part of the product broke, you could actually replace um, just a part of it and you could continue that product's life cycle. Um, as well, the, the wheel, um, I'd looked at, obviously considered how water can be pushed and pulled and looked at originally at just a very thin wheel. And with the rough terrain that you get in parts of Africa, it wasn't, wouldn't be very sufficient. So I looked at Gi uh, James Dyson's ball barrow and looked at how his ball allowed the wheelbarrow to be stabilized. Now, if I can replicate that ball by, create, by using different thicknesses of tree branches to create um, an, an actual ball and use maybe inner tubes to um, cover the ball to make it a bit, uh, I guess, easier to transport the water and, and less um, kind of pressure from the, from the road so you actually can have a, a more smooth journey, then my water carrier um, would work. So I came up with this simple idea, um, approached some charities in the UK and the Sustainable Design Award, and they actually saw that my product could be used. Um, and they would allow me to work with uh, clients and experts who would help me take that product out to Africa and um, look at distribution. However, I was only 16 and I needed to go forward to do my final year at school. Um, so it kind of got put on a back burner for a little while. But upon winning the Sustainable Design Award with my water carrier, I was invited to go to a conference where I listened to an inspirational speaker who spoke about climate change and global warming and was consuming too many resources. Now this guy really inspired me. I wanted to basically take a product that we use every day in our homes and redesign it so it doesn't use energy or it use renewable energy. So I was looking at the kettles, the TVs, and a refrigerator. And I found out that refrigerators use a lot of energy. And so I decided that for my final year at school when I was 17, that I would redesign the fridge. Now my teachers were kind of a bit shocked by this idea and it's a bit of a challenging project. But I was really passionate about the idea and thought that this is only a challenge for me and I really wanted to make sure that I could, could achieve um, a, ref a refrigeration. So I know it looks a little bit like a bird feeder or like a toilet roll holder, but actually that is the prototype that I came up with for my final year project. But the way that it works or the way that I adopted the kind of process was to do a lot of research. Now I wanted to find out how things cooled. How do our bodies cool? How do, when we sweat, how do we, we become cool? How potting pot refrigerators keep the products cool, but actually keep the products quite damp. So I looked at a lot of things that, we've, that have been around for years, um, and I actually ended up taking the product back to basics um, and created a fridge that cools by a evaporation, obviously through, um, through sweating, just as the potting pot refrigerator works, but also incorporates heat transfer. So you get a completely dry, cool, hygienic inner compartment. Now, at the time, um, after I created my prototype fridge, I realized that um, this fridge wouldn't be suitable for use in our homes just yet. It was too simplistic. You had to top it up with water. Um, but it, it had potential other uses. Well, I just um, thought about my original water carrier and how my fridge could actually be used in Africa. So I looked at this fridge and I considered how people call products in Africa right now. And I looked at how people were calling beer. Now what they would do, they'd take um, a white cool box and they would add a beer bottle, a few beer bottles, and they would wrap the beer bottle in um, maybe a uh, potato sack, for example, or something that would hold and absorb water. Now they'd cover the beer in, in this potato sack, add the water and leave it out in the sun. So as the water evaporates, by, heat, um, by the evaporation, the, the water in, or the beer becomes cool. Um, but unfortunately, you can only store beer in that way. You're not able to store um, meat, because you can't imagine wrapping a steak in, some, in a potato sack and adding dirty water. It just wouldn't work. So I thought my fridge can really go, could really make a difference here. So what I did was, instead of going to university straight away, I went out to Africa, to Namibia, to test my products. What I did was kind of immerse myself in the life. I spent time living in a township. I got to know local community members and shared my knowledge with the people that I met. So first thing that I did was spend time with the people who already had skills, the cabinet maker, the shoe maker, the people who had the skills and they had the tools to manufacture products on a daily basis. So I went with my friend Victory, who um, could translate for me, and we went round and we showed them the, the small prototype of my fridge. And we simply asked them, can you produce this product? What do you know about the local materials? 
how can I, how can we together collaborate on this idea? How can we improve it? And how can we make sure that you guys have, can have a fridge that can store food and medicine in your community? Now they were able to produce my fridges. Um, we made them out of water barrels. We made them out of um, car parts. We made them out of all sorts of different materials. But I open sourced the principle. So the idea was that actually I'd created and designed two products of water carry on my fridge that could be used in, in Africa and produced by people who really needed to use them. It was just finding those people who were going to produce them. So after spending time with the skilled guys and understanding that they could, I thought, well, how about the people who don't have jobs? How can I, what about the people who sit at home with their friends and drink beer? So I spoke to a lot of the guys who would be very happy to sit around with their friends and talk about whatever it was that they were talking about that day, put it in on their conversations and asked, how, how can you produce um, these fridges? It's a fridge and explain how it worked. And they weren't really interested. They weren't interested in, in giving up that enjoyment that they had from spending time with um, their friends and their um, families, really, over when they were leaving their families. They, just, they weren't interested in, in getting um, a job. But the people who were interested were women. Women who had to spend time with their families, look after their children, had to do the housework, had to cook for their families. These women were really passionate about, about um, kind of getting upskilling, um, understanding and, and how to produce a product and selling it, either producing it for themselves, for their families, or producing them to sell. They could actually earn money. They could um, have an independence. They could, they could support themselves and their families without having to rely on other people which was really important to me, um, and also to, obviously to the, to the women. So what we did, we took all sorts of different materials. I mean, this fridge that you can see here is a mixture of junk. So it was basically a little plastic basket in a drum. Um, as long as the inner cylinder was made of metal, um, you get that allows for the heat transfer. So the inner cylinder becomes your storage container, which is obviously dry, hygienic, and cool. Um, and for me, it was really important that I could work with these women. So instead of me just going out there and taking a product that I'd obviously designed in school and saying, hey guys, I think you should use this product. Um, I think it's going to make your life a lot easier. That wasn't the approach that I took. It was more of a collaboration, more of sharing ideas. And women knew so much more about the, the um, materials, about what was available, how they could produce their products, what they'd been doing for years, of how, to, how they'd been storing meat, um, how they'd been getting medicine to places. And so we, we both learned. It was a real joint collaboration of learning. And um, what happened was the idea took off. So women were producing my fridges initially in Namibia. I then went down to South Africa. Um, I went across to Botswana. And um, I then worked with organizations who would also help me distribute the product. Um, and what I, the other thing that I did was look to find women who became my ambassadors. So these women who could build fridges were more than happy to teach their, their friends or other people how to build fridges. And we passed on the approach. So now my fridges are used across South Africa, Namibia, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Botswana, improving the quality of people's lives. And for me, um, thinking back, you know, this was a school project. And it really just shows what can be achieved in the classroom, um, but also what can be done on a social level. So, you know, sometimes people, well, actually, when I came back, people said to me, You're crazy, you gave your products away for free. And I was saying to them, well, actually, the reward for me was creating a product, having an idea, creating the product, and seeing people use it, and actually making a difference. Um, and although a lot of people can enjoy that in their design careers, for me, just to be able to see the mass distribution of a product that I, I had in my head, um, and seeing people benefiting from it was so much more important than anything else that I'd I'd really been involved in. So I just want to summarize and kind of dwell on this stuff a little bit because I think it's really important. And I'm not sure if it's the right approach to design, but it's my approach to design. And the way that I kind of look to, to work on the products is I really like to identify real world problems um, and finding that need. I really believe that when I'm creating a product, there has to be a real need for it. Um, and that's just my opinion. But when I'm creating my products, I want to I want to believe that this creating this product there is going to be a, a difference made, and that's um, my toothpaste is fenced in my water carrier on my fridge. I hope you can see all kind of um, tick that box. But then I've started thinking about this back to basics approach. 
So the sustainability of design and how you can actually create products that consider the ultimate um, lifestyle of that product, so the life cycle of that product. So from that initial conception, the materials that are used, to what's going to happen at the end of that life cycle, and is that product going to, going to create jobs or is it going to take jobs away? Well, with, with my products, I envisage that these products were going to be made in the places, my fridge and my water carrier, in places where they were actually going to be produced. That's what was important to me, um, that people could actually produce my products um, using their locally sourced materials and that they would actually make a difference to people's lives. But then I realized that I could actually explore other applications. So after I'd created my fridge and I failed at my first attempt to have a fridge in, for use in our homes, I realized that obviously it could be used in, in Africa, southern Africa. Um, but then I realized that actually this fridge is cool, it would be cool for camping. Um, it would be good for use in, um, on boats there's actually a, a potential for it to be used by pharmaceutical companies to transport medication rather than just the storage of, of medication. So there's actual, actual commercial um, adaptations of my product. And by being kind of social about it and going out there and saying, actually, I've had an idea, I want to give it away for free, what it's allowed me to do is open doors. And it's opened doors for me to go into the, and have conversations with people about, hey, guys, I've had an idea about a commercial version of my fridge. So, and, and, and people listen. And so what, I'm, what I've been working on since is, this, is a fridge that will allow, will still cool um, via evaporation, but will be useful, you know, not made from junk, for example. You can buy it from stores, you can use it for camping, or people can just make them themselves. Um, so, so, you know, this is just a, a, different, a different adaptation of, of the same product. And really, when I think about my, my overall goal, really, is can we design more products that solve real problems and enable families to feed themselves. So the idea behind that is, are we able to design a product that will actually help somebody, but also allow them maybe to produce it themselves to support themselves and their families by selling that product? Um, a lot of people assumed that I could have just got my fridge manufactured out in China and sold them en masse to the people in Africa. Well, actually, the people who really needed my products couldn't afford to buy them um, if it was done that way. So by enabling some people to make my fridges and sell them themselves, it's actually improved their quality of lives. And I, I really want to kind of open it up to the audience and really think, you know, in the conversations that we have in the brick, what other products can we produce that allow people, firstly, to solve that problem, and secondly, to make money from it and look after it and support themselves and their families. So thank you very much.